I have with me today, and I would like to invite them up, uh, Fatima Al-Qadiri, uh, James Kelly, a.k.a. Wife, and Jakarian Morgan, a.k.a. Lotik, whose music I played a little bit of earlier today. And we're going to be talking about sonic hooks and sound design and, and, and their processes and how they... Um, and how they use them in their, in their work. So, I don't see Jacarian, but, um, all right. <laughs> um, hey. <laughs> so, I have with me here, this is Jacarian Morgan, AKA Lotik. Um, he's from Texas and lives in Berlin, part of the Janus crew. Uh, he did two of my favorite records last year, um, the Heterocetera EP on Triangle, which we played the, the, the title track off of earlier, and Agitations, which came out on, on Janus, correct? Um, which is even, I think, more advanced and more mind-blowing and just doing incredible work. Um, James Kelly, wife, uh, you are from Ireland and you live in Berlin now. Um, you were formerly in the band Altar of Plagues. And uh, as wife, you did the Stoic, uh, EP or uh, EP on, on Left Blank in 2012, and then in 2014, uh, What's Between album on Triangle, a lot of Triangle alum here, and then finally, uh, Fatima Al Qadiri, um, a solo musician, also a member of Future Brown, uh, alongside Jay Kush and Nguzu Nguzu, born in Senegal, raised in Kuwait, uh, then New York, uh, and now Berlin. Uh, she, her discography, the, the kind of the, the, the high points, the big things are the Desert Strike EP that came out on Fade to Mine in 2012, Asiatish on Hyperdub in 2014, and just like right now, Brute on um, Hyperdub. So thank you guys all for being here with us. I guess for, to start off, what's, the, what's the, the interrelation between sound design and composition in your work? And who wants to go first? <laughs> um, for me, they kind of feed each other. Like, I mean, I think it's, it's good for me that a lot of what came before kind of basically explained my process, which is kind of like, I'm actually really nerdy in that I understand what's going on almost all the time with a sample or anything, but I don't want to do the work myself. <laughs> like, I just discovered Polyplex and like that's gonna write my album, basically. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, I'm, I'm like a very impulsive person, so I go, I want something that sounds different. Uh, like, I'm never gonna use like an 808 kick or whatever, like it's gonna be changed somehow. I'm gonna spit, I, I say spit on it, like a lot. I'm gonna spit on everything. Um, <laughs> and that kind of like, I, I will always have an idea of a song in my head from going out or like, especially being at a place like Bergheim where it's like such a perfect place for what it is. Like it was literally built for one thing and it is really good at that thing. And that has really like shaped the way that I think about not only composition, but like mood, like emotion. N not exactly that, but kind of like, I guess purpose. Like techno is very like, it has a utility. You're supposed to like stomp. <laughs> but there's also like Berlin techno has a very, there's like a lot of sound design involved and yeah, it's, for me, it's like, they're not really separate things. I will write a track based on a cool sample, or I will just put a cool sample in the background if I really have this strong idea of a track, like a structured composition in my head. Is that a similar approach for you guys? I mean, how, does, how do you... Where does, I mean, James, for instance, I know you, you work a lot with field recordings, I think, or at least you did at one point, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, so how, what's the, the process then of, crea of composing with, I mean, because you're, you're singing, you know, you're writing vocal melodies and lyrics and you're recording your voice as well, and then you're also using uh, field recordings. What, can you walk through the, the process of that? I mean, one of the reasons I really like using field recordings is because coming from a band recording background, I really like that 
microphones recording a band and amplifiers are capturing like the sound of that space and time, whether wherever that recording studio was, that kick drum sounded a particular way in that room that it would never sound like in another place. And for me, field recordings are also a way of like adding a private narrative to stuff I'm writing. So I've got tracks that I've made from like, I was recording a guy busking in Beijing and I turned that into a melody for my own track. When people hear that track, they just think it's like, you know, a melody he probably made on a DAW or whatever, but actually it's a field recording that I chopped up into a melody. Um, but really when it comes to like writing melody for me, I mean, Kabuki used a cooking analogy and to be honest, I've got the same philosophy because I love to cook and when I cook you scrambled eggs, even though you've eaten them a hundred times before, it's the way I'll frame it on the plate or whatever way I decide to season it is going to make it different because melodies are the same. They've all been, they've all been written before. Like mm -hmm. writing a new melody is like, you're not going to do it really. It's going to be how you season it and what you do to frame it differently is going to be what makes it stand out. I was really interested uh, listening to your, to your album, the, the way you work with your voice almost as though it were like a plastic material, I mean, with, with multi-tracking and then kind of sculpting that as you go? Yeah, I mean, that kind of came from like, when I began to make music, I sampled, I think the first track I made was a track called Bodies and I made it in 2012. And like everybody, I sampled Brandy and Monica. And it worked really well and everyone's like, whoa, that's so sick. And then you just get to a point where it's like, I can't keep sampling Brandy and Monica. Everybody should stop. Please leave them alone. <laughs> um, and I just got to the point where it's like, I kind of like my own voice. Maybe I'll start sampling my own voice. And I think it just kind of, that technique grew from there. Uh, Fatima, you have a really specific palette, I think, in a lot of your work. I mean, it's, it's evolved, but there are certain kind of constants you like those really breathy kind of choral pads that, that I think of sort of the, the Laurie Anderson Superman thing. Um, you, you tend to use a, a lot of contrast between kind of soft, silky sounds and really hard, jagged sounds. How did you arrive at your chosen palette and, and what drew you to those sounds? Um, I feel like it's more... I'm less concerned with sound design, more about writing melody and then finding the right fabric. It's like the melody is like a piece of clothing. I'm always gonna make this t-shirt, but like, I just have to find the right VST instrument for it. Um, so I start writing melodies first and finding sound later. And that's how I work with all my tracks, but the choir, I've been obsessed with um, Gregorian chant as a kid, and I've always been obsessed with, actually all devotional religious music is somehow voice-based, and Islamic religious anthems, and uh, you know, Catholic music, whatever. I've always been obsessed with choir, but I'm not a singer, and I can't sing instead of 20 people's, but I always want 20 people's voices on my tracks. Um, so I use choir pads or something that are just gonna always be on my records <laughs> until I die, basically. <laughs> um, but I also think about ownership of sound. Like, I feel like there's artists, it's like, yeah, that's, a, uh, that's this person's, like, once a person has used a sound enough, it's their sound and no one can touch it. And I feel like there's this like bass sweep that is running through all of my tracks and now I feel like I own it. And even if I use it again and again and again, it's my sound, you know? Can you describe the, the bass sweep, of what it is and how you make it? Um, so nobody else will ever do it again, <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but I just feel like it's really interesting about this like ownership of a VST pad or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, um, it's a logic preset that I've barely manipulated, you know? But um, I don't know, this, the thing is with the harsh and the soft, the harshness comes from, I think, or, uh, this like minor key aggression that is running through a lot of my music uh, has to do with me and my little sister 
we used composition as a game when we were kids. We would compete against each other uh, to make um, bad man music, you know, or like bad guy music. So we would all, when we were watching cartoons, we always wanted the bad guys to win because the good guys were too corny. <laughs> and the bad guys had the best music, always. They always had the best theme songs. So we were just basically making bad guy theme songs and battling against each other. And that's how it started. But we, I, I don't have the skills technically, I don't think, um, to make really like harsh music, you know? I, I do my best, but there's always the, so I'm a softie. <laughs> I'm like a softie trying to make hard music. <laughs> so that's really, that's how it came out, you know? I, I was curious about kind of an, another angle in terms of ownership of sounds. Um, and this goes back to Hetero Cetera and the Ha Dance. And I was curious, I mean, that, that's a sound that, that has become a staple in ballroom culture. Um, and it has also recently um, kind of proliferated and spread beyond ballroom culture. I know that I think it was uh, Cashmere Cat used it in Ariana Grande track. Um, and I know it's been used in a ton of other places. And when I spoke to you um, last year, you told me that you had wanted to use the sound for a long time, but you said that you wanted to find the right way to do it because you didn't come from that culture and you felt like you wanted to do it in a respectful way. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I made, so on my first EP, More Than Friends, which literally was like the first three tracks I ever wrote. There's one, I don't remember what it's called now, but there's one track where I made a really pathetic attempt to rewrite that riff. Like it was, I think it's F sharp C A or something. But like, it's like really not, I mean, it's not those notes, but that's kind of the approximation. Um, but yeah, when I started, it was like, I didn't have any framework for what I wanted to do at all, except for like these, there were like two or three maybe ghetto gothic remixes out at the time. Like there was nothing. I'm in Texas, Austin, Texas, which is supposedly the music capital of the world. <laughs> um, South by, come on. Zero electronic music, and I have nothing to go on. I have, all, I've been a musician my whole life. Like I started when I was twelve playing sax, blah blah blah, and yeah, that was one of the first things that made me want to be a producer. Like I did college radio, like everyone else, and that was one of the first things where I was like, wait, like. I want to take over the world, kind of. But I, but I, yeah, I'm not from New York, and I didn't know, like, you know, I had seen Paris is Burning, but I didn't, like, know what was going on there. It's the same with bounce music. Like, you just, you have to be respectful of local culture because it's local, and it doesn't matter how big it gets. If you're interested in it and you want to be a part of it, you have to become a part of it. Like, you have to get approval of, from these people. And I had been sort of talking to people like Leaf and Mike Q a little tiny bit, but I was like, no, don't touch it. So, like, Hetero Cetera really started, that was also one of my first things, but I couldn't do anything with it. I like manipulated the sample for years, I told you. Yeah. <laughs> like until it became hetero cetera. Um, but then it was so crazy. I was like, I don't know how to make this a track like that people can listen to. So I kind of like went too far, but then I realized that that was kind of like the power in it's like appropriation, but not really, because it's like not at all m meant either to make me money or to be a part of the ballroom scene. So it was like a an appreciation by like just carrying. Like it was like, for me, that's how I became okay with it, was by pushing it so far that it was like, you know what, I'm not even trying to be a part of this. I am just, really inspired by it, and I hope that people like this track that I made. Um, Fatima, you did, 
I mean, you, you dealt with kind of appropriation issues uh, when you did Asiatish. And I was curious if you could maybe talk a little bit about this idea of Sinogrime and kind of where that came from and what made you want to work with those sounds and in, in the context of Asiatish. I feel like it ties back to the idea of villains. You know, mm. like for a very long time, Asian, and when I say Asian, I mean Chinese motifs in... Uh, Western media over the past, I don't know, 150 years, this Asian motif has two meanings and two meanings only, villain and wise man. There's literally no other meaning. It's just those two. Mm -hmm. So I feel like one of the reasons they became so popular with rap producers and with grime producers is that they wanted to be wise men and they were perceived as villains, so they wanted to own that villainy. Yes, I'm a villain. I'm a super predator, bitch. You know, <laughs> like they approached it that way, but also because there was so much competitiveness in rap production and in grime production that they were using it to battle each other. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. My like childhood battles with my sister over villain music, I was kind of doing a micro reality of what rap and grime producers were doing with each other, you know? Um, and that appeal obviously came from, first specifically for Sino motifs, you know, I think started from Disney uh, all the way to Bruce Lee, and I think that with Bruce Lee, with Wu Tang, that's when it became elevated. You know, Wu Tang were the first explicit about um, using those motifs, and then it just carried on into grime. Jammer is probably, I would say, the number one producer of Sinogrime. Uh, he's composed the, or produced the most tracks of Sinogrime. Um, I just found it very curious that this was a link between UK and US producers that wasn't even like um, talked about, mm -hmm. you know? But it is what I want, going back to is this notion of the villain and of being a wise villain, you know? Yeah. It's interesting because a lot of you guys use, maybe not you so much, James, but you, you use these kind of iconic sounds in your work. I mean, there's, the, there's been a proliferation of these things in, in electronic and even pop music. There's the, the bed squeak from Jersey Club there, the, the gun cock and the, the, like the shell clattering to the ground from, from grime and from southern hip hop. Um, there, are, there are more that I'm forgetting. I mean, there's the breaking glass. There's all these kind of sound effects. What draws you to those? And I mean, how do you, how do you use them in a way that feels fresh? Or what do they bring to the track? Yeah, for me, um, yeah, I did a whole mixtape that was like basically dedicated to the air horn because I, <laughs> like, I realized that was that when I moved here that like, uh, some, for some reason, reggaeton is seen as a super low form of music, and people were like mad. At, I've had people come up to me after shows like, "Why did you play reggaeton? Like, you know that's not okay here, right?" And I'm just like. No, but also I don't care. Like, it's like, for me, it's like I'm so young and I have, I started, I didn't get serious about this until I moved here, like in 2012. So I feel like I have to pay my dues, you know? Like, I'm not gonna touch anything without, like, I'm not gonna pretend like I'm doing something new. Like, I feel like I have to pay my dues. And that's, for me, that's where, it's com where it comes from is like, I kind of know, like, I don't ever want to, like, dance to a house or techno set, really. But at the same time, I know that I wouldn't exist without these things. So it's kind of like paying back, you know. But there's also, like, it's so much easier to do so much more with the sample these days that, like, you, when people don't, I kind of get really mad. <laughs> so it's, like... Me being a nerd and also, well, me being a nerd and like kind of meeting in the middle of like <laughs> having this 
like respect for history and also like not necessarily I'm I hate that the word futuristic is used for me actually because I feel like it's just the present. Mm. I think there's just a lot of people that are looking a lot to the past. Like electronic music isn't that old. Um, anyway, I'm ranting, but yeah, I, it's, it's sort of like a, it's like a, for me, it's like a little, it basically paying respect to everyone that came before me. Like it's always important for me to like name drop or whatever. Or like it's like, you know what? They did it first. They did it first. This person, this person, this person. This person. Like I'm never gonna accept that I'm an innovator. <laughs> like that, that's not a word that I want associated with me. It's funny talking about the signature sound stuff. Like I remember when I got started, and because I like to use like a lot of noise or texture in my sound. It's really funny how like the burial reference is the immediate default reference for anybody who has any tone filling. And I'm always just kind of like, it's, it's very lazy and kind of like similar to how people use the word futuristic. It's like a really kind of slapstick throwaway kind of uh, reference that's, that's kind of maybe somewhat like undermining what the person making the work was actually intending to really do with it. And like Jakirian said, maybe you're paying homage to your influences. And you know, if somebody says, oh, that, that track was inspired by Jersey Club or that track was inspired by Massive Attack, whoever, you should be like proud to be able to say, yes, it definitely was. Whereas sometimes people are, you know, afraid that if their track is, if its references are called out, they're like ashamed because, you know, no, I'm so original, I don't have references. That's, that's bullshit, of course, everyone has them. You've talked about how, how you've been influenced by pop increasingly in, in your own music, which is super interesting because it's the opposite of what you did before. Um, I mean, how did what you did in Altar of Plagues, does it have any bearing on what you do now as wife? I mean, do you carry bits of that through, especially uh, in your sound design, I guess? I mean, yeah, I think it does. I mean, it's where the, the record I made for Triangle, What's Between, was like, a singer-songwriter record that I just kind of felt like I wanted to get out of my system after being an angry metal guy for 10 years. And, you know, you just can't keep that up forever. It's exhausting. And, you know, I've, made, I've got the singer-songwriter record out of my system. And now, you know, the new stuff I'm writing, I would really describe it as going exactly in the direction I saw Altar of Plagues going it in before I broke it up. And the last Altar of Plagues record was really like, I call it a black metal record that was made in Ableton. And to be honest, when the band broke up in 2013 and I made that record in 2012, I honestly anticipated like that was what was going to happen in metal anyway. And still, it seems like it's not really as prevalent as I thought it would be yet. But, you know, that's kind of why I'm going to... I think Wife is just basically going to head more in that direction. Um, Jakari and I wanted to ask you about something because uh, talking about sound design and I identified a sound in, in one of your tracks. I think it was Trauma. And I could have sworn it was a crow. And it still sounds like a crow to me. And I said something. I mean, I like crows, so this is not like a bad thing. I love crows. Favorite bird. Um, so I heard the sound, and I tweeted something like, I love the crow sound yeah. in trauma. And it was not a crow sound. Yeah. What was it? How uh, did you make it? And when, what, what, like, what did that sound mean to you? So I actually lied. Um, <laughs> It was like a dubstep sample or something. <laughs> but yeah, the track was called Trauma, so I needed it to sound like, ah, you know, like yeah, yeah. Uh, not a crow, but <laughs> a man sort of like screaming in pain. And it like had to be a man, you know? It had to be like a straight man who was being strangled by his wife or something. <laughs> um, that was the second thing I thought it yeah, was after the crow. Like, I guess with that record in general, Agitations, like I was thinking a little bit more about sort of purpose. Like f before that, it was always very random. Like it was like, okay, here's every sample I've collected in the last like month, let me write a track. And with this, it was over the course of like nine months or something. like really, really slow. I've never worked that slow in my life. Um, like, the actual composition happened very fast, but, like, the thinking about it and the collecting the sounds happened over a long period of time. But, yeah, you can do a lot with 
any sample. It's sort of like, again, I guess like I have a theme now, like purpose is important. Um, for me at least, like it's important to think about what you are trying to achieve with a, not necessarily a sample, but a track overall. So the, the screech was actually attached to this drum sound, and I was like really annoyed by it at first. <laughs> I was like, okay, I want the drum, but like I couldn't get the screech. I, there was no way that I could cut the screech out. And so I just s succumbed to the situation. I was just like, okay, fine, there's just gonna be a screech. <laughs> and I'm just gonna embrace the fucking screech and I'm gonna make it as loud as possible and I'm gonna call the track trauma. Like, <laughs> I'm not gonna fight it. Like, that's my approach to sound design is like, there's never like a particular sound that I have in mind. There's always like, maybe one thing I want to add a little bit of or something that I want to take a little bit out. But for the most part, I just go with the flow. Um, yeah, I don't, I guess that ends, I don't, there was no question, but yeah. Um, I, I was wondering for, and this is for all or any of you, to what extent, um, kind of visual cues uh, have an impact on, on your sound design or your composition? Because what I've, something that I had to skip over in my presentation earlier, but I feel like lately in a lot of things like the, uh, the Fractal Fantasy, the Zora Jones and Sinjin Hawks project, um, or also in Sophie with those like water slides, I feel like there's this very sort of synesthetic relationship between um, graphic design and the sounds contained within. I mean, this is not, nothing new, but I feel like there's kind of a renaissance of design and visual art and music. And I was wondering, especially, I mean, you have the, the album cover to Brute is working off of uh, a, a visual artist. To what extent are you guys thinking in, in visual terms? I mean, maybe it's just me, but I, I hear a lot of these hooks and I see... I think of, I always do this, I'm like plastic, it's like stretching. I see like this idea of sound being kind of um, tactile. And I just wondered if, if that kind of factored into your processes at all. I mean, your, your instance is a little bit different because you're working with, I mean, it's a very specific kind of piece of art. Could you tell us about the cover? Yeah, I mean, it's um, that Teletubby on the cover uh, a brood is a sculpture called Popo, and it's based on the Teletubby Po. Um, and it's part of an installation called Freedom, in which these Teletubbies with uh, TVs embedded in their stomach, dressed in National Guard riot gear, um, surrounded by trees with zip tie handcuffs and credit cards, and a, a video of Barack Obama um, basically fulfilling all the promises that he made in his campaign. So it's, it's, it's a really incredible, immersive experience. Um, and when I saw it in, I had already, because I know Josh and I worked on the music for the video part of it, um, I didn't realize how iconic the image was until I saw it in person of that Teletubby, and I had already started working on Brute. And um, I was very lucky that um, he was into the idea. I was like, I need, I was just thinking really about icon something that's iconic, you know, more as I get older, as I have more resources at my disposal, I feel like, you know, iconic record covers is something that you always strive to do. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like it was exploring this relationship between um, police and citizens, which is this kind of like infantilization uh, of a person when a police person comes into contact with them, you know, like that Cartman respect my authority type of craving, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they want a kind of respect that is reserved for the elders of a society and you're a kindergarten child talking to an adult and that's how they want you to address them, you know? So I feel like that was something that was hidden inside this image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I felt also like 
I hate this word because it's like used for everything now, but like the cynicism also of like using a Teletubby and like it like also like that is another layer of it where it like added like like the situation in the States right now is so ridiculous and like you can't make fun of it, but like that to me was I'm yeah, I'm uh, you saw the text message, like I was like, girl, like what? Like this they're not gonna be able to handle this. Like <laughs> It just, yeah, it's, you know, it like, at first glance you laugh, but then you're like, wait, 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 there's a lot going on here. Like, yeah, my, for me, it's kind of, I think I have images in my head. I work closely with one particular person, um, Alberto Ochoa, who works as Kisalina, and he's live, he lives in Munich. And I guess, like, at this point now, we have this one sort of character that's, like, evolving as my music evolves. Like, hetero cetera, there was the sort of glass skeleton, and with agitations, you see more of, like, the flesh, but you only see, like, like this much. Um, and I, yeah, for the same, the same thing, it's, like, I want to... I want you to stop at my album art. I want it to be iconic in one way or another. And I get, I get the comment a lot that my music is cinematic. Maybe that's because I studied film, maybe not. But it, the visual element is important to me to sort of, like the music is so complex that like I know that I need a visual image to like, for people to latch on to something. Like if you see this like weird angel skeleton thing on a white background, then you have in your head already an idea of a kind of world that I'm trying to create, which you may not get from hearing the record itself. James, what, what role does the visual play in your, in your music? To be honest, I think for me, the visuals are usually birthed from the music itself. Um, and I think when I'm making music, there are certain colors and tones and things that are inherent in it. But I also really enjoy the process of collaborating with visual artists because what we do is so solitary. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a pretty miserable thing to really insist on enduring the whole thing um, on your own. Um, so I think for every record I've done to date, it's been a case of music first and then the visuals are born of that and then in this instance I'm about to finish an EP and I think it's the first thing in which I've almost like I've envisioned an environment and that is like the music has like I've created the music to exist within this environment that I've imagined which is kind of this Costa Rican rainforest I was living in for a little while before music I was an environmental scientist uh, and basically it's the sound of the chainsaws removing lush green uh, parts of the rainforest, and that's kind of what I'm trying to make right now. Wow! And are you are you using actual chainsaw recordings and then processing that? Yeah, I've got like some different stuff. Wow! Exactly. That's <laughs> <laughs> and you thought black metal was heavy? Take you know, that. in music school, when they tell you to write a really beautiful song and put the sound of a chainsaw on top of it, that's that's the thing <laughs> I'm doing right now. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions from the audience out there? Then I'm going to take one from uh, the internet. And Liam asks, and I guess this can be any of you, do you guys plan your songs? Is it going for a feel or sound or visual, or do you just make something up on the spot? I hate y'all. Um, yeah, I guess I answered this a little bit kind of earlier. It's, um, yeah, it's a bit of both. There will be times where I'll be at the club and I'll be like, oh my God, this is like an insane bass line. I'm going to steal this right now. And I like leave the club immediately. <laughs> um, and there's other times where I'm just, you know, sort of like writing or reading something. And I like, it, it won't necessarily be a sound. It'll be a photo or some words, a quote, an idea. And I have to specifically recreate that one. But at the same time, I like, I like to use tools that um, sort of really randomize samples. So I, I, don't, I don't like ever really want to know what I'm getting, like not really. So it's a bit of both. Like I'm 
for the most part, really specific about what I want, but at the same time, I just have to like give up most of the time because the process of manipulating a sample can really, really like change a track drastically with within 30 seconds even. It just rarely ever sounds up liking, sounding anything like you planned in the beginning way, does it? Yeah, like I can try to make a R&B instrumental all I want, but like I know that I'm gonna end up like downloading like 500 a cappellas and then I'm gonna be like, okay, this one Sierra G flat and like this like Beyonce A and like, like it's gonna, like it gets crazy for me like really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, at this, like, I guess the answer is no, I don't plan basically because I want to, but then I just go with the flow for me. I was just going to say, I just um, turn on Logic and get on the keyboard and improvise. I really like, you know, like writing. What I said before is like writing comes first and sound comes after, always with me. So I'm just like, I've been doing that since I was a kid. So I just always like just improvise. I rarely um, go like think of a visual thing or a sound or that doesn't really happen to me, you know? You, you wrote Brood or started writing Brood during a period of, of extended convalescence, right? And I, yeah. And I, listening back to it, having read that, I, I, I was intrigued by like, trying to kind of connect that mind state with the sorts of melodies that came out, you know? because it feels very much like a theme in Variations to me. And I was, just, I was curious, like, how, what was the, like, the connection there? I think being in bed for a month and not being able to walk makes you go a little nuts. So I was basically going crazy <laughs> and being in Kuwait, oh my God, <laughs> like, I love Kuwait. I mean, it was really hard. <laughs> it was just really, re that's the thing, I was, I, was, I was composing, I always compose when I'm about to lose my mind, you know, so it's really, but it's just it's therapeutic, but um, I definitely advise trying to improvise sometimes. I, I definitely have never used samples, like, like starting writing music with a sample to me is something very alien, you know? But I'm always so like curious how people do that, but I, I guess that people have their own patterns and I'm a very uh, habitual animal, you know? Um, cool Rave, I have another question from, from the internet. Cool Rave X asks uh, for wife, <laughs> what music motivates you? Cool Rave X. Uh, it sounds like actually the kind Wait, of... Wait, can we... <laughs> I want to show everyone how it's spelled. I was hoping it was X, <laughs> but it's E-C-K-S. Well, it sounds like exactly the kind of music that I used to love, which was cool rave music, which to me is like seminal prodigy, uh, Chemical Brothers and that stuff. Because basically when I was like eight years old growing up in rural Ireland and me and my friend were watching cartoons on Saturday morning, his two older brothers would come in covered in mud, wearing flannel and cut up denim. And I was thinking, I don't know where these guys have been, but I really, really need to be a part of whatever that thing is. And it, they were listening to The Prodigy and doing what people listening to The Prodigy were doing in fields at that time. <laughs> so that did inspire me. Uh, and now I think I'm just like everybody, I'm pretty eclectic this week. I think the new Kanye is amazing. This weekend in Iceland, I went to a really incredible black metal festival and saw some really amazing Icelandic black metal bands. So, unlike everybody, I've just got very taste, and it just depends on a weekly basis. Do we have any other questions from the audience out there? Don't be shy. Hmm. Um, we've got one more question from, from the internet. Uh, Matt Live wanted to know, what workflow approach do you find most successful in finding good hooks? Who among you is the hookiest? <laughs> I think Fatima is. She's, she's, uh, she's being shy, but that whole Future Brown record and stuff's pretty hooky. Um, but 
I think that I kind of answered that question with improvisation. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like if you try to sit down and like, I'm writing a hook now, you're not going to succeed. You know, like, don't think, just, you know, like, you ha I feel like whenever, maybe that does, that is too narrow, actually. I feel like whatever works for you, but seriously, like, don't try to, to just start writing a hook immediately. Try to write whatever you can write of the track and you'll eventually get to the hook, you know? Um, so I don't feel like there's like one approach. My approach has always been, you know, improvising until I get something. And sometimes when you improvise, you don't get something that day, you're not, there's this expression in Arabic, like the angels are sitting on your shoulders, you know? They weren't sitting on your shoulder that day, so you gotta give up <laughs> and wait until they sit on your shoulder, you know? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm the same. I really just keep doing stuff <laughs> until it makes some kind of sense. And yeah, like I said earlier, like the, the compositions tend to come out especially now, like more and more complex. So I feel like I need something to make the track click. There's always like a thing that has to be, yeah, basically the hook. And that's always the last thing for me. It's like trying and trying. I was like, okay, this is like a cool melody, chord progression, whatever, but like this isn't like, no, like no one's gonna listen to this. And like, I never get to that until the very, very end. And it's because, yeah, of improvisation. I'm just like, okay, that didn't work, that didn't work. I'm not trying to write a hook, but it's just like, this track is just crazy. Nobody just wants to hear just crazy. I don't want to release anything that's just crazy. I want it to be crazy, but accessible. <laughs> like, I want that one little, like, one little thing. I'll give you one thing. And the rest crazy. The rest, the rest can be crazy, but there has to be, because I listen to so much pop and like hip hop and it's important for me to like bring that into like the world of electronic music because it is electronic music. Mm. And so I use very simple melodies and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, um, hooks are important to me because I am crazy, basically. <laughs> Um, we're going to wrap this up now, but before, uh, before we do, don't go away because we have a back-to-back -back set coming up from uh, Night Trips and Soul Mind. So stay where you are, don't leave, and um, stick around five minutes and we'll get the music going. I want to thank my co-panelists today because this was really fun. I want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, thanks, Electronic Beats. Thanks, Native. Uh, thanks to my co-presenters, and see you next time. <laughs>